I really think Etia Hoffman is one of the most fascinating uh, writers of the, uh, German writers of the 19th century. Um, his real name is Ernst Theodor Wilhelm Hoffmann, and he changed his um, name into Ernst Theodor Amadeus. Um, every one of you knows of, uh, for sure um, who he refers with, with this uh, name change. He was a great admirer of uh, Mozart, of course. And, um, yeah. So he had a big passion for music. He was not only a writer. Um, and actually, in his younger years, it was not so clear for him if he should if he should become a composer or a writer. He followed his parents, who decided, well, the son should have a good education. He should study law, and he did that and became an official. As time on, he could work as a conductor, as a composer, as a writer, as a theatre director, um, something I have forgotten, I'm pretty sure, as a music teacher, of course. Um, yeah, so um, he was uh, talented in, in many, many ways, um, so his first publications uh, at the same time, when he first published uh, literary texts, he uh, also his first um, singspiel and his first mess were performed, and he was very proud when his opera was brought to stage in 1816. The title of the opera is Undine, and it was a pretty good success. So also his um, musical works um, were very successful. And uh, the third part of uh, is his artistic talent was he was a um, pretty decent uh, drawer. So we have also a map of his drawings published. Um, yeah. In literature, um, Hoffman is um, pretty well known as um, somebody who describes um, the world of crime, of fantasy, of demons, of the supernatural. Stephen mentioned that already. And he also focused on the depths of the human soul and uh, psychic diseases. So this uh, all topics uh, coming up in all his stories. And um, I think it's also interesting to know he was uh, the first one in world literature who wrote a mystery story, Mademoiselle Scudery. So that's the first mystery story in world literature. And um, um, we also know that Sigmund Freud, the founder of uh, psychoanalysis, uh, used his story, that's also a part of the opera Hoffmann's, uh, the tales of Hoffmann's, the story of the Sandman, um, was uh, the model for Sigmund Freud, uh, Freud to describe the uncanny but in a very specific way, and I think that's um, uh, very important in the reception of Etia Hoffmann, that he wrote, um, uh, the big quality of his literary texts is that he always keeps the story very ambivalent. You never know, is it now a dream, or does it describe reality? And I think that's a big quality. And we see that in the opera, but we see that also already by Sigmund Freud. They define him and make it very clear, so that's the uncanny, and the uncanny is something, is, um, is something, uh, is, 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 the, is the strange, um, the, so the uncanny is not strange, the uncanny is the strange we find in ourselves, so that's a quality. Uh, of the internal life of a human being. So, but um, what's really important with the works of uh, Etia Hoffmann, this is uh, the time uh, it takes from. 
so um, the stories were written, published um, so between 1814 and 1822 when he died. Um, and this was um, only a couple of years after the brothers Green uh, published uh, the collection of fairy tales. So we have these fairy tales or parts, ideas, motives from the fairy tales that always come up in Hoffman's uh, stories. That's one point, and the other point is he's a pretty ironic writer and a big critic of uh, enlightenment, uh, Stephen mentioned already. So uh, this uh, idea of rationality, uh, that's something he didn't believe that really. And, and uh, this science in the early 19th century, so I just want to bring one example, that's the so-called mesmerism. That's a kind of um, a medical treatment with magnets. Uh, that's a um, fairly new age theory. The theory is there should be a good flow in your body with your energies. And this guy called Mesmer uh, had the idea, yeah, we use magnets and we can heal people. So I've read it was pretty painful and uh, medical schools don't believe him. So it was not very successful at that on. But uh, of course, um, Hoffman was very interested in ideas like this. And he used it in the stories uh, or uh, he criticized that. Um, his way to um, use means like irony and humor in his stories makes him a very uh, postmodern writer as well. So we have out already, it's not, uh, so this is this ambivalence, um, it could be always otherwise. And so it's no wonder that he was pretty influential for many, many artists. It's not. Um, so, for example, uh, writers um, such as Edgar Allan Poe or Fedor Dostoevsky are not thinkable without the basic of Hoffman. And it's, uh, he also inspired uh, composers as Tchaikovsky, you know, The Nutcracker is based on, on a fairy tale by Hoffman, and of course, of Offenbach. Um, what I also should mention is there was a pretty different reception of Hoffmann in German-speaking countries and in France. So in, in France, uh, the audience was always more open to Hoffmann, whereas in Germany he had um, a big antagonist, so it was uh, uh, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, who did not like uh, um, the, the kind how Hoffman wrote, and there was big critic, and the audience followed more Goethe. This was one of the reasons he was not uh, um, that successful in Germany, and he only became um, more um, admired after uh, about around 1900, so in, in 20th century. Um, but I would like to come to the opera, to the libretto, uh, to the stories told and uh, the stories, Hoffman stories used uh, in the opera. So, um, of course, we have um, the, uh, uh, the uh, this first act with uh, Olympia uh, that's based on the story uh, The Sandman. Um, and it's um, pretty interesting because it's only a part that's used. It's only um, uh, the Sandman is, is a storytelling uh, tool of stories of this Nathaniel. Uh, Nathaniel has a um, long going relation uh, with a young girl named Clara who uh, grew up together with him. So his mother took Clara and uh, his brother, his brother in, in her house and they grew up like siblings. And uh, this is a very um, rational uh, relation 
population, how it should be, and also Clara is a, a character that stands uh, uh, stands for enlightenment and for bourgeois thinking. So um, she is the one who always tells him when he um, recognizes uh, um, this glass and uh, telescope cell uh, Coppola in the story as the Coppelius, uh, the guy who killed his father. And it's not even clear if Coppelius killed the father, so his uh, um, Nathanael's father and Coppelius uh, did some alchemistic uh, experiments together. And there was a big explosion and Nathanael's father died from that and Coppelius uh, lef left uh, the city, so he was never seen again after that story, uh, until uh, Nathanael is a student in another city, and this uh, Coppola comes and uh, sells him uh, the telescope. Um, so, and then we have uh, what's left in the opera, what went into the opera is this, um, I wouldn't even call it a love story, so I always have problems with that. But he falls in love, he gets in flam by this automaton, by Olympia. And uh, it's the question, what we have here, it's the question of perception, of seeing. So um, for a long time, Nathanael um, observes Olympia uh, with a telescope sold by this coppola. And this telescope changes um, the view on, on these girls. So um, Nathanael in Hoffman's story dies at the end because he uses this telescope again and sees Clara. And Clara becomes this uh, uh, puppet. So and then he tries to uh, kill her and she gets saved by her brother and he suicides himself. So what's, uh, uh, what went to the opera is uh, the story by Nathanael, and Nathanael is replaced by Hoffman himself. So I think that's the really interesting thing in the opera, that Hoffman takes um, the position of his main characters in all the stories are told. So um, also these main characters become exchangeable. The um, lose their own personality, they certainly have in their stories. Um, but I only, I was a little bit long with the Sandman, and I cannot tell you all the stories. Um, so, uh, the second, and this was already mentioned, uh, this Antonia story is um, based on the short story by Hoffmann, Rad Cresto, Councillor Cresto, or in, in in the translation also, uh, the Cremona violin. And this is from the collection the Serapion's Brothers. Uh, the prologue starts uh, in this guest house, uh, Luther, and there was really, in, at the beginning of 19th century, a guest house in Berlin called Luther and Wegner. And it was the guest house Hoffman spent many, many nights and try uh, and um, having his friends uh, gathered among him, uh, um, around him, the so-called Serapion's brothers, and he told them his stories. So um, these stories uh, uh, were not written at the first moment. So, but um, Hoffman uh, used his friends to test how um, interesting the stories are. If they are um, eager to hear them or they don't work so well. And only in the sec uh, at the second step, he wrote them down and published the stories. And um, that's uh, another uh, important thing, this, um, this intense interactions with this with the audience. So audience was very important for Hoffmann and that's something he shares uh, with Offenbach. Uh, also Offenbach uh, needed uh, uh, the admiration of his audience. Um, but I owe you um, 
um, um, some more information uh, on uh, the Julietta Act. Um, this is based on, on the story by Hoffman, The Lost Reflection, The Verlorene Spiegelbild. And it's connected with another very, very short story, um, um, Die Gesellschaft im Keller. So we have, um, uh, yeah, so and the both stories are from uh, the collection The Adventures of New Year's Eve. Um, so and again, we have, um, and um, we have uh, the same reduction of the stories, especially in the, uh, in the Antonia Act and in the Olympia Act, where um, the love story is reduced to the story of the fascinating, or, uh, uh, yeah, of the fascinating uh, uh, woman and uh, the relation with the, um, with the serious uh, uh, woman um, is, is uh, deleted in the opera. Uh, yeah. Um, so, and again, what I want to emphasize, uh, to emphasize is uh, this question of per uh, perception, and that's the point I, I, I want to end. Uh, um, uh, with uh, this is this idea, uh, Hoffman never really sees this women. So this is my way of of reading uh, um, the stories by Hoffman as well as uh, the libretto from uh, the opera. Um, it's not important for him uh, what these women really are. He gets inflamed by them. He is really uh, full in love and. Uh, um, uh, yeah, very much in love with them, and then he figures out, oh, well, Olympia is another mountain, um, Antonia dies, and he has to uh, leave Julieta because he has killed accident accidentally uh, a man in Venice. So, but every time the story ends, and he has another drink, um, it's not taken that serious. Lead, so um, it's not that important for me. So actually, I don't follow uh, this idea. He he um, is um, he loses so much with every love. I think uh, this uh, these women are not that important for him. They are only important to tell us a good story, and they are good for inspiration. They are his moons, but. Um, um, well, after the story is ended, he has a drink again with his friends and life goes on, he's an artist, so 